Hey guys, my name is Mark from jazzguitarlessons.net and welcome to another vlog. In this episode, what I want to discuss is a framework for jazz guitar improvisation. Not only doing it, improvising and soloing, but the way, the pedagogy I've been using with my students for the past several years to teach improvisation and how to progress. Because it's already difficult enough as it is to go be on the spot and provide do ideas that are spur of the moment it's also uh, challenging to find a way to make progress to go how do i improve the way i improvise and that framework is called the three pillars of jazz improvisation i know i think i did a google and other people have uh, use this term pillars of improvisation but this is mine uh, it, it's totally different from everything else i've seen so far so uh, let's get started number one thanks for being here appreciate your, uh, you watching the videos. And of course, my mandate is to get across to you simple, applicable, and no-nonsense tips to master jazz guitar. So of course, thanks for being here. Please like and subscribe this video to see more. And there's plenty more stuff from the past, uh, wow, now uh, over 12 years of materials on, on this website. So let's, let's get started. The three pillars of improvisation are as follows. I'll summarize and then go in detail. Number one, there's a pillar that I call define the sandbox, which is your pillar one. I'm going to put it here, OK? It's like the a Greek uh, monument, the par Parthenon. So pillar one is defining the sandbox. It means playing accurate note, notes uh, on chord changes. So I'll get to that later. Second pillar here is outlining um, the point of chord change. So when there's a chord, then there's a next chord, there's a bar line. You want to outline the change between the chords in your improvised lines. That's pillar two. And the goal is, of course, to connect chord. Uh, the name of it's connecting chords logically, but also the purpose is really so we hear the changes. You know what they say, play the changes. Well, that's what it means. It's really to connect chords to one another. And number three, the third pillar is to learn phrasing and articulation, meaning the ultimate goal is to be able to play anywhere in time so within the bar but also within the form of a song say you play a 12 bar blues are you able to start a phrase on bar three b3 right something like that so combine together your three pillars of improv improvisation will hopefully have a roof on their head and that roof is actually your creativity that's getting all the syntax and all this grammar helps you in um expressing yourself, telling a story, building a, a story arch or doing good storytelling in a sense of a musical a narrative uh, storytelling. And I'll get back to this, but there's also a foundation of this, which is, you know, understanding chords, understanding comping, understanding the standards and all this vocabulary. So let me, uh, of course, you can look at the timestamps below. And let me just take a moment here to tell you, this is more advanced stuff I'm about to discuss. So pillar one is pretty much for anybody getting into jazz. Pillar two and three are more intermediate and advanced steps. So if you would like to get a uh, follow up by not only a, a guitar instructor, but by a coach, if you'd like to get coaching and mentorship, book a call with me. It's totally free of charge. Just go to nextlevel.jazzcatarsons.net. I have a fantastic roadmap I can share with you. So let's just chat about your challenges and see if I can not only be your teacher, but also keep you accountable, keep you honest with this improv stuff. All right. So back to pillar one. Um, I will put timestamps below here so you know where to go to pillar one. But first, I want to have my little bit of an, an analogy. Yesterday, I went live with my uh, Jazz Guitar Mastery program students. I do this every two other week got together and answered some questions. And I, I shared this exact way of thinking, which is you have to think similarly as learning a language. Uh, of course, you need to sit down and practice patterns. Same way as, of course, you need to learn words to speak a language. However, imagine if you have a, a dictionary and all you do in your language, say English, or French for me, just go in and every day learn new words. It doesn't necessarily make you a better novelist, story writer, or or it doesn't necessarily give you the skills to better um, express your ideas. So I had a student yesterday after I described the three pillars said, all right, how, where do you start? And my thought is, start with an idea. I'm going to talk about Stephen King, for instance, great novelist. There's a story about this person in this context, and this happens, and the person, person does this, and then that character in the novel thinks about the stuff and you read it, right? So all of this can be 
put on paper in words in so many different ways, right? And of course, after the fact, once you look at it, oh, that was an adverb, oh, period at the end of your sentence, okay. And then that was a, a noun and a pronoun, and here's a description of the, the, the scene outside, and here's a description of the facial traits of that character, right? You see where I'm going with this? It's the same with music. Yes, you need the skills and you need the scales and the arpeggios and the standard progressions and whatever, but more importantly, what you're attempting to do, your ultimate goal is to say something not just to prove that you know the scales to play on. All right, so that's my little caveat. Let's start with pillar one. Pillar one, um, and I'm gonna put timestamps if you wanna skip between pillar one, two, and three in the description below. Pillar one means you want to have 100% confidence on performing notes that belong to the chord. Namely, if you have a chord symbol at the top of your, sorry, baby crying in the background, if you have a chord symbol at the top in the real book or something like that, you'll have C major seven. It does mean that there are seven notes that are good, quote unquote. So developing your pillow one means that you want to develop your ability to play that while you see you see the, the chord symbol on top, all right? It's, it's pretty simple. So it, people <laughs> will start with pillow one and get to me and go, yeah, when I improvise, it doesn't sound good. It's like, well, you're not at a point of trying to make it sound good right now. You're just at a point where you want that to happen. All right. So you guys, you know, there's tons of information, books, DVDs, websites like mine, where you can know how to play on chord changes. So you can know how to play on C major seven without necessarily just doing that. And without necessarily just doing whatever. So you want to develop some sort of vocabulary. So imagine we'll be on C, that's a C major nine. Just strum the chord and play an idea. And then people say, Mark, how do you do this? Well, this is parts of scales. This is parts of arpeggios. This is part of, uh, you know, practicing the scale until it becomes second nature. So your ultimate aim in pillar two, if you're able to do this, and play just the good notes, and then say the chord changes. I'm gonna do something funky, uh, A flat minor seven. All right, this chord. So we're here, and then we go here. Are you ab able to mentally shift gears between C major seven, play a short idea, and then A flat, chord change. That's A flat Dorian. And then that's it. It doesn't mean that your ideas need to be deemed or judged as any good or um, uh, stylistically correct or whatever. So it doesn't matter. We're talking about realize that there's a change and you have a mental switch that happens. This is, and uh, uh, ultimately I'm not uh, uh, blaming, judging, or condemning. This is not something you learn when you do blues improvisation or rock improvisation. In those contexts, typically you'll have one scale, you have one sound, and that's your solo, right? In jazz, it's always surprising when I get these emails, like, do you get to tell me that on giant steps, John Coltrane would go like, there's a chord, change scale, change scale, change scale. yes, yes. That's, that's it, that's your challenge. Your challenge is to negotiate that like you slalom on a ski slope and still make music at the end of it, still reach your roof. So it starts by knowing the right notes. Tons of exercises. I recommend you start with the basics. So if there was two bars of C major seven, then two bars of A minor, A flat minor seven, I'll go like three, four. Just spell it out. That would be in time, right? See if you can copy me. I'll improvise. C major seven, A flat. All right. So that's a brief overview summary of pillar one. Now let me get into pillar two at this moment in the video, where I'll timestamp it, of course, and. In pillar two is where we're concerned with, all right, what's happening at the point of chord change that I can outline to make sure that even if you take out the accompaniment, that your solo can outline that there's a chord change. And I'll start with the very basics of this. It's the resolution of the seventh. We have that, the resolution of the seventh, since classical music. I'll pick a G7 
and then it goes here, right? So the seventh of G seven, the F note, that note. If you play your shells, uh, you can either do like this or like this. That note wants to go down. That's F E that wants to resolve. So G seven to C five one. As I'm going fast through all this because I want to get to the juice and pillar three. Um, this is what's going to make your line sound like there is a movement from one chord to another. So not only do you need to be precise as far as what's happening with the, the sound itself, so pillar one, play accurate notes, but then you need also to say, whoa, there's a bar line here and there's a new chord there. What's happening at the end of my line here needs to transition. And yes, again, it is that challenging. It is that hard to do this. You need to negotiate changing keys on the fly. You need to negotiate knowing when the bar line is and that you make a line. Let, let me start you up with something with a 2, 5, 1 in C major. So C, D minor 7 to G7 to C major. So what's going to happen is you play on 3rd and 7. So if you, and there's tons of my videos about that, of course, if you play the 3rd of D here and then the 7th, that 7th of D is going to want to go down to the 3rd of F, uh, of, of G7. And then that 3rd, the 7th wants to go down. So you hear. If you can plug that in when the chord is changing in time during a 2 5 1, it's going to sound like you have this 2 5 1. So let me, let me demonstrate this not too fast, just out of thin air without a backing track, so you know what I mean. So I'm going to feel free to comp for me, then feel free to rewatch that segment without the comping to see if you hear it. You ready? D minor 7, G7, C major 7. A 1, 2, a 3, a 4. outlining just the right notes of each of the chords that went by. Yes, uh, people, you guys are clever. You find out like, oh, D Dorian is the same as G Mixolydian is the same as C major. Yes, it's true. They're the same seven notes. They're not oriented in the same perspective, but they're the same seven notes. So you play the accurate notes and then pillar two, at the point of chord change, it went. You heard that within my lines, even though I was doing um, uh, uh, say in French, we say that it's sewn, S sewing, uh, uh, coudre, you know, with a with a needle. It's just like I'm going in a needle and doing the, these funny patterns, but ultimately that's what I hear. I just hear the big, the big milestone. So that's uh, check out the book Connecting Chords with Linear Harmony by Bert Ligon, L I G O N. Bert Ligon, so piano player and guitarist. So <laughs> that's amazing book for for that kind of stuff. Um, and this holds true, according to Ligon, of course, not just for Charlie Parker and Miles Davis, but also for Michael Brecker and Pat Metheny and John Schofield and uh, all these modern players. If you hear something that sounds like jazz, it's most likely because something like that is happening. You know, Bill Evans, Cannonball, Adderley, whatever. Caveat, last sort of parenthesis. Once you master the three pillars, you can revisit the second pillar and go, oh, wow, now there's this happening. Again, I keep referring back to Cannonball Adderley because it was such a great example of this. We're playing so what, right? And there's just one chord. The guy is just sitting on this D minor seven for like bars and bars and bars. And you hear, pick it, check it out. It's on Kind of Blue, classic album. He solos, and of course he's in D Dorian, but then he goes, yeah, you know, I'm getting tired of this. So let me do lines. I'm going to play lines that outline some chord changes, some a chord progression that is not written and it's not getting played by the comper right now. I'm just going to do that. So it's funny that you can have your you have a piano player giving you that. But you while you solo, you might pass so, another chord progression. So you need to be so strong at that. That's people ask me, how do you play out? I'm like, well, you need to play in very strongly in something else. So while you have a D minor sound, maybe you play, you 
comes on a B flat major seven arpeggio during your your D minor improv, and you pass that chord going to the next chord, going back to the next chord, and you weave it in and out. But you're not just playing random things relating back to the D minor. You're playing things that are strongly implying another progression on top of it, and it has to be done masterfully, or else it's going to sound blah. Right? It has to sound. It has to happen. You need master of that. All right. Um, I'm going to leave it at that for second pillar. So recall, first pillar, play 100% notes. If you can't do this yet, don't even worry about your voice leading and your voice change and outlining the changes. Just make sure you can play accurate notes. Pillar two, once you have it, go and see if you can transition and play smoothly between one chord and another. There's always one strongest resolution between chords. If it's happening in the cycle of fourths, it's always the resolution of the seventh. The seventh resolves to the whatever of the next chord, typically the third, not always. All right. Third pillar. So the third pillar I'm going to summarize, but that's for really more advanced guys. Here is where you want to control the flow. So of the, your lines, right? So if you're really good at pillar one, like really, really good, like every chord that happens, like, like they become targets to shoot. You get good at that and you get good as well as at connecting your targets that you always sort of outline what's happening. Chances are, if you reach that point, because I did, you're going to not be able to shut up. So you're going to play all the time because we don't need to take a breath. Wait, we don't have this horn right in our face. So we just piano players and guitarists go, blah, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the third pillar, you will attempt to learn phrasing, articulations, also how to play on top of the beat. Uh, check out Wayne Krantz, you know, or playing right on the beat, playing behind it. How does it feel? And my pedagogy of that, which again, I, I do this in my Jazz Star Mastery program through the Improv 101, 102, and 103 uh, modules. Um, and they're roughly, Improv 101, 2, and 3, they're roughly pillar 1, 2, and 3, but there's overlaps, of course. So what you will want to do is look at the bar line, say a 4-4, four, four, and say, hey, there's eight eight notes. So there's eight locations within that bar. Sorry, screensaver. There's eight locations within within that bar that I could start my line on or that I can end my line on. Have you tried that? Have you seen if you can do a phrase that starts here and lands there? I start on the end of two, I land on the beat three in the next bar. And that's, that's a Bill Evans trick I saw on YouTube as well. So once you ask this question, you can ask yourself, where can I start and land? How long can my phrase be or short? Can you play a three bar phrase? You know, can you play a three bar phrase, shut up for two bars and then play another three bar phrase and shut up for two bars? That's called pacing, which I got from uh, Hal Crook in his How to Improvise book. Just like, all right, you need to put these things in space. So where could you start in the bar? And where could you start in the form? You know, have you taken autumn leaves and say, I want to start a solo line in the third bar and I want it to finish it over there, you know, and playing triplets. I don't know. Right. So that's pillar two. It's like controlling the flow of information because you're going to get <laughs> with pillar one and two, you're going to become a machine gun like Pat Martino style, although Pat Martino is always amazing. So it's just like <laughs> you, you shoot these eight notes and 16th notes and you're going to be so accurate and so good. But then in the third phase, the quote Mike, Michael Barra, one of my, my teachers, just said, you become so good at that, that eventually you decide, do I want to delay that resolution? Do I want to anticipate it, play it further? Do I want to avoid it? Go like, yeah, there's a 251. I'm not going to resolve the one. F you guys, you know it's the one. I'm not doing it. I'm going to control my own flow. So that's essentially um, articulation, phrasing, playing laid back, phrase length, uh, pacing. You know, how much do you want to play very dense? Do you want to play very little? Miles Davis versus Dizzy Gillespie, right? You, you get to decide that. Again, I'm going to summarize the three pillars. If you're concerned with that and like, oh, I want to work on my phrase length mark and whatever, and I pitch a chord progression at you and you can't do pillar one, well, why are we talking about your phrasing? You need to play accurate notes first, right? It's same thing. If you would want to play really, really good phrasing, but you can't yet connect chords properly within your lines. I'll say, no, work on pillar two at first. All right. Now, let me put all of this in context and then I'll let you go. Sorry for the long vlog, but that's <laughs> sort of an inspira ins inspired moment. It's an inspiration of mine to teach in, in that fashion. So what you have 
is playing accurate notes, connecting the chords to one another while they pass, and the third pillar is phrasing properly. And then on top of that, you have your ceiling, your roof. It's going to be, this is your creativity. This is how you tell a story. So all of this, of course, is Im it's implicit that you know the vocabulary. So you listen to the great players. You know the, the licks. You know the, the standards. You know the progressions. You know the cliches of jazz. Uh, same way as you would know writing a novel. After It's implicit that you sort of know what a verb is. You know what a tense verb tenses you know what a an action is you know what a thought is you know what a you know you know these idioms in your language and you know how to express these things you know how to express a certain character's feeling so in music you know how to do a flat nine you know how to do a, a, so basically my caveat here is this is self-expression this is self-actualization it's it is not the combination of jazz is not just a show of skill is the skill is of course you know of course this is a sentence, of course this is a character, of course this is a scale, of course this is a flat line, but that's, it becomes less and less important as you're trying to say something. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the foundation that I simply, I skimmed over. So your foundation to put your three pillars on, well, <laughs> to summarize the three pillars is like, play the changes. You've heard this expression, right? Just don't wail, just play the changes. So this is my attempt at providing a teaching and learning framework for myself and, and students to, to make sense of where to start and what to focus on, right? So your foundation of making the changes through the three pillars is knowing the chord progressions. So yes, the standards have two five progressions. Yes, the B flat blues jazz has this, and sometimes West Montgomery used this tritones up. You know, it's knowing how to comp, how to be a solid accompanist behind a singer or a sax solo. It's knowing um, uh, the 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 tunes, the, the history, the, knowing the players, like Charlie Parker plays blues versus Michael Brecker plays blues, different story. It's still the same blues, but you, you need to get acquainted and that's your foundation. If you don't have this foundation, as I get, um, sometimes get students who are like, I want to learn jazz, I don't listen to jazz, and I don't want to play jazz songs. <laughs> like, <laughs> why do you hear that? You know, it's like, you need to, to know that it, it's more of a uh, tradition. It's more of a history than it is a purely technical art form that's, oh, this is correct, this is not correct. It's fine to go and study the harmony and the chords and the changes and, and the alterations and how to, to write uh, songs and song forms and 7-8. It's fine to do it through jazz. But if you want to become an improviser, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Same as I keep referring to this example of playing flamenco. If I'd go to Spain right now, personally, I'd be totally like I'd need to study for 10 years at least just to start to grasp that thing because it's totally foreign to me. And it's not like I can learn flamenco in a vacuum and just extract the technique from it and say, I'm going to take on my own. It's like, no, you need to immerse yourself. So guys, go and immerse yourself selves, and listen to Miles Davis and Wes Montgomery and all this stuff. And then listen to the newer stuff to see what people have done with it. You know, how did they... Uh, uh, elaborate the vocabulary. How how did they change the chords? How did they decide to negotiate with these sort of challenges? Right. So that's art ultimately. Uh, all right. On that note, I'm sorry for the long vlog, guys. I hope you've enjoyed. This is my three pillar approach. Uh, please like and subscribe if you want more. Also, get on a quick call with me. Next level. .net or see link in the description below. Um, updating the links on the website these days. Uh, we can get on a call. I can show you this pathway. So my three pillars is one thing. Uh, also, I have a, a few more things in my trick bag. I've done. The, I've been doing this for for a while. So uh, lots of very um, very A player students right now. I'm really. I'm. I'm totally blessed. I have people around me like this. So get on a call with me. I can show you the roadmap. And if nothing else, we can just have a quick chat, and you you can really gain some value and clarity as to where to go next to learn uh, how to play better jazz on your own. All right, on that note, I'll let you go. I'm Mark from jazzguitarlessons.net. Improve your jazz guitar playing with a real teacher, and I'll see you soon on this vlog. Take care.